Hi, I'm Joanne Murphy, and welcome to Try Talking Sport, the podium podcast for athletes, adventurers, and endurance enthusiasts. Welcome to episode five of Try Talking Sport. Today, I'm joined on the show by Chris Mintern. Chris, a 25-year-old triathlete from Cork, has been taking part in the sport of triathlon for a little over 10 years. He is the current national champion across sprint, standard and middle distances after back-to-back wins in the standard and middle distance races only eight days apart. He has to date achieved much racing success locally, nationally and internationally, representing Ireland at junior as well as under-23 world championships. This year, he switched his focus from racing short distances to now chasing podiums across middle and full distance events. We chat about all things triathlon from training to racing and everything in between. Huge thanks to the team at Hop Hop and Base to Race in Dublin for the use of the studio to record the interview. Chris, welcome to the show and uh, thanks for taking some time out from training to have a chat. You've had a really successful career to date, but for those who may not know your history, tell us a little bit about your background and the sport of triathlon. Um, thanks very much for having me on the, on the podcast. Um, so at the moment, I'm racing as a professional triathlete on the Ironman circuit. And in terms of my history, I've been doing the sport now for maybe 12 or 13 years and um, started in Yall in 2000 and 2006 maybe as part of a relay team where I just did the swim and the following year I decided to try and do the, the whole race and yeah it's just progressed from there to, to where I am now. So in terms of um, growing up with the sport you've really spent probably the last 10 years uh, in the sport of triathlon and happy birthday by the way for this week 25 years yeah. of age this week Thanks you're getting much. old I know yeah I just said uh, I said on Twitter yesterday that I'm nearly getting or it won't be long now before I'll be giving out that young fellas aren't training hard enough so looking that, forward to that that's <laughs> true you also mentioned something on Twitter about uh, looking at lads in Irish uh, tri suits uh, and uh, your dad gave you a bit of a roasting on Twitter yesterday. Uh, it was just uh, just a bit of a joke that if you see somebody wearing an Irish tri suit at a local race, that um, you don't have to worry about them. But uh, <laughs> I kind of got caught really because my dad sent back a picture from 2012 where I wore the Irish tri suit at a local race. So yeah, I got caught there. And then I think you wore the full Irish tri suit on the podium as well. Yeah, didn't you? I, went, yeah. I went full kit. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Very embarrassing. Yeah, we won't we won't talk about that too much. Yeah. Um, but I suppose I just want to chat to you about like you know you've come up from being a swimmer at the kind of the age of ten with Sundays well. Uh, you were running with Lee Vale and, and your biking obviously is, is, is incredible at the moment. But talk me through kind of the younger years of, of who Chris is and coming from Cork and getting into sport. And what else did you do? Did you play any football or hurling or anything like that? Yeah, I played uh, hurling football for the Bears. Uh, and I was swimming with Sunday as well, running with Lee Vale. And then I think when I got to maybe 15 or 16, I wanted to focus on triathlon. And that's when I parked the hurling and football and just decided to focus on swimming and running and I was doing a bit of cycling not that much at that age and yeah so since then I've like the the swimming club in Corkson as well really strong leave it as well as a really good history of producing top class athletes so that's where I was um, yeah that's what I've been doing since then so you've, you've had a kind of a mixed bag of results over the years. You've been quite successful. Um, you then went off chasing some points for ITU, racing around kind of 2016, 2017. But this year, you seem to have just grabbed onto some bit of a breakthrough, I suppose, is maybe the wrong word, but the right word in the sense that you now, as of the last two Saturdays, hold three championship titles in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Um so I spent most of 2017 and 2018 racing in European Cups and World Cups chasing, trying to get points. And yeah, that was quite difficult. You know, you're traveling to um, to countries that you, you, you wouldn't probably go on holidays to, but you're just chasing points, trying to get your higher up the ranking. And yeah, it's, it can be, traveling alone is, is fine, I think, when you get a result and you're happy enough traveling home and you're excited about what's next and but when it goes bad it can be quite tough you know you wake up in um, a small fishing village in China and you're trying to organize a transfer back to the airport and you need to pack your bag and your bike and then you're thinking like what what am I doing (laughs) like like I'm not 
doing what I want to be I'm not getting the points I need you're questioning you know am I good enough for this or is this the right decision or maybe I'm panicking by doing these races too soon trying to get points when really I should just be training um, to be in a better position to ensure that when I do travel I will get the results so all this stuff kind of goes through your head and was this on trying to get towards Tokyo yeah yeah this was all to try and get points towards Tokyo but um, I had a string of bad results last year that basically put me out of contention because there's two qualifying windows from May 2018 to May 2019 and more from May 2019 to May 2020 but you need minimum of five results from May 2018 to May 2019 and I didn't have five good results that would have put me in a position to make it possible to still be chasing for points this year so it wouldn't have been possible for me to to qualify. So in the depths of being in that fishing village in China wondering what I'm doing with my life how did that then transform to deciding to get a professional license for 2019 and chase some fairly lofty goals and yeah. uh, race with some fairly incredible athletes uh, over the past couple of months? Well, I al- I've always thought that I've, the longer distance stuff would have suited me and I think some of that kind of stems back to the fact that in Ireland most of the races are non-drafting. So when I grew up and all the years I spent racing in Ireland, the bike section was non-drafting and it was just a time trial effort. And then when you go away to race a European Cup, it's a draft legal race and it just completely changes the dynamic of the race. And sometimes after races, I've been wondering like, yeah, these guys are great, but I wonder if it was non-drafting, would I be able to to take some of them? And then it kind of made sense that, well, with the Ironman 70.3 racing, that's the way it is. Like, And so it's always something that I, I wanted to do and probably started doing it a bit earlier than I thought I would. But... The transition has gone really, really well this year. And to be honest, I think all of that is down to the training group I'm with at the moment with Hop Hop, with Gavin and Aina, and where we are based here in um, in base to race. Like everything we're doing is, is it's just really good. And I want, so when I started this season, I'm starting with like a blank slate in terms of longer distance results. I don't know where I am. Am I, again, am I fooling myself? Could I be one of the best in the country? Could I be one of the best in Europe? Could I potentially be one of the best in the world? So I thought, what better way to find out than to seek out the best guys? So that's why I went to Germany to race the German Middle Distance National Championships because that's like Germany is the stronghold of long course triathlon. Um, And so I went there and at that race was Sebastian Keenla, who was former world world champion of the Ironman distance, Andreas Streitz, who's who was who was European champion last year. There's a lot of other guys. There was I'd say maybe nine to ten guys who are regular podium finishers. And I went into that race with I won't say no expectations. I did have expectations, but uh, I just wanted to see what I could do against them. And I came out of the swim at the front. And I had a good run. So looking back on the splits afterwards, I think, okay. So you finished eighth overall. Finished eighth overall, in yeah. In this race. Yeah, so it was my first ever top 10 in an international race as well. Plus it was your first ever 70.3 on an international yeah. level, international scale. Well, well, looking at the results, I saw, okay, I've got a minute on Keeneland, right on the swim. I thought, that's okay. And I looked at the run splits. And I think Keenla ran a one thirteen twenty for the or one thirteen thirty, and I ran one fourteen minutes or one hour. I ran one hour and fourteen. So I was like, okay, I'm close. And then I looked at the bike splits, and he put thirteen minutes into me, and I was like, how am I going to take thirteen minutes off a ninety k bike? Now the, I know he's an unbelievable cyclist and stuff, but that's just I suppose that's just my nature. When I when I went to do this, I just I said, who's the best in the world? And what do I have to do to, to beat them? And but so when I came back from that race and when I'm back here now training with the group, we'd made some changes on the bike and stuff in terms of aerodynamics and kit. Just and like you'd be amazed at what small changes can actually make. Um like a slightly better fit, a slightly better helmet, you're looking at one to two minutes straight away, and that's without any training, you know. So there's it's the first time ever that I can honestly say I've had to start looking at the, the smaller details 
before it was just you know I could do with a bit more training do you know what I mean like you could just train a bit harder yeah. and now it's at the stage where it's like I'm training hard everybody's training hard it's a bit like Tesco every little bit helps yeah yeah <laughs> You know, everybody's training hard. Everyone yeah. in your race is. Yeah, is it's, it's the it's the fi- it's the little one percent. Yeah. that makes all the difference. Finding those little tweaks. Yeah, um, but I want to go before we go talking about your bike because I do want to talk about your bike and how you train and and some of those changes. But then you raced um, at another seventy point three distance race as well um, after yeah. the first one. Two weeks. Yeah, two, two weeks. weeks after that. Yeah. So I I just tried to um, get both races done while I was in Germany at the time. Mm. And um, I went to Kreitschau then, so uh, Fian Fadino was racing mm-hmm. in this race, um, Olympic gold medalist, Kona winner, I mean, he's probably the biggest name in triathlon, but uh, I came out of the swim with him, and I was happy with that. But How did that feel, coming out of the swim? Well... Did you give him a few elbows, or did be you honest, uh, behave yourself? To be honest, I expected to come out with him, okay. I was kind of... I was, confident in my ability to swim with him but I mean that's only one section of the race there's a lot of horse after that <laughs> how did you fare on the bike against I was, uh, I was quite poor that day on the bike and the run but I think a lot of that was the fact that um, it was only two weeks after my first half and I probably underestimated how much recovery I needed mm. between races but what I will say is it taught me a good lesson for what recently happened at the national championships because I did the half Ironman national champion the middle distance national championships last weekend and this weekend was the olympic distance so there was eight days was it yeah, saturday and race and then a sunday race the following week yeah just my approach to recovery was completely different as in I, I only got out of bed to to train i was lying down the resting i walked to the car to drive to the shop i did did nothing besides just train and lie down yeah and eat yeah and eat yeah because um I probably did a lot of walking around last okay. time between and you think when you're walking around that you're not training but it's still it's still taxing on the body when you're trying to recover yeah yeah uh, come back to the bike because I want to talk about your bike uh, before we move into talking more specifically about the races last weekend um, the setup on the bike you've changed it quite a bit you're yeah. a lot more aero now so I'm on riding the Quintana Roo PR6 mm-hmm. and um, here in base to race um, there's great bike setup here and we're constantly looking at changes that can be made. So when I first got the time trial bike, I wanted to be picture perfect. You know, you see pictures of the guy. You see Ferdino and yeah, he's a tabletop. Yeah, and they're pan yeah. flat. And I was just like, yeah, make me look like that. So I put the, drop the front bars as low as possible. I was just taught like, oh, you know, just go as low as possible. And Dom, who does the bike fits here, was like, are you sure? Like, I don't think that's sustainable. Like, you're going to have to work into it like you know you need to have a strong core and strong stability to be able to to maintain a position like that and I was riding for maybe a minute or two and I couldn't breathe like I couldn't breathe and I couldn't produce any power and I was like they make it look so easy but it was just wasn't working I had to come back up I couldn't I presume it's years of gradual movement down towards the front as yeah. you get stronger and stronger and your core gets stronger and your back obviously well that's what we've well. done because I've slowly dropped the front end of the bike over the past few months and now I'm in a position that I can ride the bike comfortably in a position that a few months ago I could I was struggling to breathe um but so yeah. so do you drop the bike every month or so do you come in for a bike fit every month or six weeks or something yeah like every to check six or? to eight weeks we have okay. a look at it and we have a look at the, my numbers on the bike and see if i can still hold power in different positions yeah. i saw you eyeing up some new bike shoes this morning downstairs as well so i presume there's a whole area that you look at as well with regards to the helmet the bike shoes and even your your kit that you wear yeah well you just want everything to be light and aerodynamic so I'm looking at possibly lighter bike shoes at the moment, um, because when you see when you see the speeds of Keenla coming past, you know you need you want everything you can get because you can be sure that those guys are on everything as well. Um, so yeah, it's it is gotten to the stage. I know it's a bit crazy where you're looking at. Could I shave off a few hundred grams here, and um, just to be a bit more competitive and to have to carry a little bit less weight with you when you're racing. It's hugely important, isn't it? Yeah, it's um, yeah. No, obviously, from for ninety nine percent of people that are doing triathlon, you could probably do with training a bit more. 
Do you know? And the strength and conditioning yeah, and the core, which we all leave to yeah, the side. Um, yeah, I mean, another thing that was making a lot of headlines recently was the Nike 4% shoes and mm-hmm. stuff. And it's like, if you went from running maybe two days a week to four or five days a week, you'd probably see more improvements than a pair of uh, runners. But I think it's just when, when things, when the margins are smaller and they're second separating people, that's when you, you want to, and even for your own head, you want to have, you want to be on the best kit because you want to give yourself every opportunity and you don't want an excuse. You just can't have an excuse. No. Like, and I, and I suppose coming out of that first uh, long uh, middle distance race there with Seve and um, coming back away from that, you must have been buoyed up in terms of your own ability to race the distance, having finished eighth overall in a really stacked field of athletes. To come back then to Ireland and go right, I've made the correct decision at the moment, and I'm going to follow this path. Yeah, it was really exciting because it's the first time. Like I've been quite disappointed. I've always feel like I've underperformed whenever I've raced abroad, and um, I always feel like I haven't delivered what I think I could. And I think that was the first time that I was coming home from a race with my head held high, thinking I'm I'm comp- I, like confirming to myself that I'm. Co- that I can be competitive at international level. I always believed I could be, but I started doubting my, I started to doubt myself a lot recently. And then with that result, I was just, yeah, it just gave me peace of mind that I'm, I'm making the right decisions and that these guys aren't superhuman and they're not a hundred miles away from me and they're, they're within reach. And honestly, I think beatable, you know, and it just takes a little bit more time on my part and then a few more years possibly is strength on the bike and yeah that's 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 where my mind was at after that race and it's a great I suppose kind of endorsement of the fact that you've switched from that ITU moving more towards the longer distance stuff the 70.3 and gives you I suppose a sense of um, encouragement maybe to move forward and to keep following that path yeah it definitely has helped with training when I know that when I'm getting up in the morning that I'm training to race some of the guys who are the best in, in Europe and the world and I want to put myself in a position where I can um, put them under pressure, you know, and be competitive with them. In dealing with, I suppose, the disappointment of races that haven't gone your way, I mean, how do you deal with the back chat in your head that's telling you you're, you know, you shouldn't be here or you should be here or, you know, that was crap and what are you doing? You know, how do you, how do you stop the chat yeah, in the back of your head? It's hard because I think um, social media can be tough as well when like Instagram and it's just a highlight reel and everyone's life looks amazing and like you know you might post about you know your highlights and your good results and things but I I don't like it when a post is filled with excuses for not having a result and sometimes I just just don't say anything because I don't have anything to say you know it's just like I didn't have a good result I don't yeah I just didn't have a good result you know and I kind of I kind of um, go inside my own head a bit, maybe for a while. I might be a bit quiet. I mightn't. I mightn't talk, reply to messages or something. I might just need a few days just to pick yourself to back pick up. Pick myself again. back up. But yeah. I think what what worked quite well before is I um, myself and Kieran Jackson raced together um, a few times at European Cups, and some days he'd have a great result, I'd have a poor result, and other days I'd have a good result and he mightn't. But what we always what we said to each other was, "You have an hour." So after a race, you have an hour to say what you want, give out how much you want, and be as nasty as you need to be for an hour. And after that, it's over. Like, the race is over. On to the next one. You go out that night. You go out for food with the group, with the team, whoever you're with. And you try and make the most out of it where you are. You've, and, you know, there's no point in dwelling on, um, on that for very long. You have your hour to get over it. And then you just focus on... What's next? What's next, yeah. That's a really good strategy to have, actually, isn't it? Even in general, for life, that you have an hour to just... Yeah, but you do need to give yourself that time to analyse it. And I think even the hour afterwards is fine, but maybe an hour, even a few days later as well, because you can over... um, Be overcritical. Yeah, in the heat of the moment. But a few days later, if you reflect then, because you might think or say things that aren't necessarily true immediately afterwards, but... Yeah, but there's no point in um, holding on to it for, mm. forever, you know. And it's the emotion and the passion That's as well it, yeah. on, on the finish line. But it worked well because you don't want to be, um, if you're with a group of people, you don't want to be, um, you don't want to be dragging everybody down as well, you know, if you have a bad yeah. day. And at the same time, 
but at the same time, if you have a good result, you don't want to be rubbing it in everybody's face as well. You know, you need to try and um, play that well. You need to be, I suppose, humble in your yeah. achievements and modest in your your anger at maybe yeah. something kind of going wrong. I think that worked well with Kieran though. Whenever we went, whenever we raced together, is that we always that was our, our yeah. that's the way we worked. And he's it. having a great season as yeah, well I this mean, year. It was a pity he's he's sick recently that he couldn't race national yeah. championships because he's in great condition at yeah. the moment. I saw him um, in a tie and he had, he had yeah. a great race. But we're we're training here together and it's just class we're pushing each other every day. And he's, so is there a sense of camaraderie then across the team here with Hop Hop? Yeah, and I mean, the, yeah, with, with, the lads? with the training group we have here, like the. I honestly, this is, I think facilities are overrated. Honestly, I think the most important thing is people. The, what people bring to, if you have committed coaches and dedicated athletes and the right um, attitude and mindset in the training group, that far outweighs facilities. Like Even though the facilities here are excellent, oh, I mean you're probably on a yeah, well, you we do actually, actually have everything. everything. Yeah. You could if they put a if they put a hotel on top of the building, you actually would have yeah, a live-in training you'd never facility. Have to leave. No, but we have absolutely everything, but at the same time, it will be nothing without the people. And I suppose it's the culture that Aina and Gavin yeah. have created and even the rest of the team here with Base to Race that the support that they provide to all of you, not just from a coaching perspective, yeah. but from a friendship and a social perspective as well, which is hugely important as a triathlete because most triathletes train on their own. Yeah, it's or nice they race on their own, I suppose, as opposed to training. I mean, on it their is own. an individual sport. It is. And, it's not like a you know, team or. But, and that can be hard because I'm talking to friends from home. And they play GA, nice guys, love 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 playing GA and stuff. And they think the triathlon stuff is crazy mm. because they're like, all right, Chris, let's say you win a world championships. Do you go back to your hotel room and have a few have a few cans and go to bed? Like, do you know? Whereas, yeah. like, after becoming a world champion, whereas if they win the local, the parish championships, you know, they're on the rip for the week. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so it's... Um, but it's I suppose, funny. yeah, they, but yeah. they have the camaraderie of each other then as well in terms yeah. of training. Like if you look at some athletes now, obviously there's a lot of people join tri clubs and there's a big social <clears throat> aspect to that as well. But if you have athletes who train on their own and only catch up with the club every so often, it is a very lonely sport. Yeah, it is. It is. It can be lonely, but um, I think you have to be driven from within to be good at triathlon. I think like you can be, you can kind of be dragged along at team sports, and but you have to, be, you have to. The drive has to come from within when it's an individual sport because nobody really cares at the end of the day uh, besides, you know, coaches, family. But, like, if I don't go training, like, it's not causing problems for anybody else besides me. You and know. the coach and getting the coach given out to you. Yeah, yeah, but with a team, it's probably a bit different in that mm. regard. In terms of what drives you, so you talk about driving you, you know, and, and motivating you. What, what motivates you to get out of bed in the morning and to, to come and to train as a pro athlete? Um, I think just for me it's that I think I can do more like I think there's any of my results so far that I've achieved I still don't think I've achieved my potential and that's literally what keeps me going that if I packed up now I think down the road I'd be sitting thinking what if you know I like even when I do have good results and, I t- and they, they have been some have been good I still think no there's still areas that I haven't um, looked you at you want to chase those 13 minutes on the bike yeah the exactly exactly there's these like these things go through my head when I'm when I'm lying in bed at night like I'm just thinking like sometimes I can't sleep like just thinking about what I could do or um, if this went well could I be in potential for a medal at a big race and I honestly think it could be eventually so that's why that's what keeps me going mainly the fact that I think I have I still have results to achieve that I haven't yet yeah do you put, an awful, lot, do you put an awful lot of pressure but an awful lot of pressure on yourself yeah I probably do I probably do and yeah yeah I put a bit of pressure on myself but I think that can be healthy unhealthy at times but uh, I, I have high standards and I've always had high standards in school in um, I mean, you have a degree in maths and applied yeah. mathematics as well, isn't it? Or yeah. Uh, so I studied um, math science in UCC, math science, math science in UCC, yeah. joint honours in maths and applied maths. And I was surrounded by wizards for four years in university. Like those guys were next level. Like in primary school, I thought I was a genius. 
in secondary school I thought I was okay, I was bright enough and then when I went to to university with these guys I've I felt very much below average for four years. Like um, but like that's and it's the same for in sport and academics when you surround yourself with good people and who have a high standard, it just drags you drags you up like like I was surrounded by guys that were a lot more intelligent than me and they just brought me to another level and I I ended up with a degree and figuring out things that I never thought I'd be able mm. to do but it was just class like to if you're gonna yeah you don't want to be the I've seen this before you know you don't want to be the smartest person in the room and that's what, like for four years I was just like fighting for four years to, to, to try and match these guys and it was really really tough like really tough and you were training and racing at the same time yeah I, maybe once or twice did it break me but I don't regret it at all like I absolutely loved it and like it might sound really tough but I loved it like do you think it made you stronger uh, in terms of what you're doing now that you went through four years of uh, yeah. of college I mean it's a high achieving course you are a high achieving athlete high achieving yeah. in terms of your results uh, academically um, you know do you think it gave you a good stronghold for now for when you're going out chasing against the best in the world well uh, my proudest achievement is probably the degree more than anything I've done in sport because it was the thing I've probably found most difficult. Like I absolutely, I've all I love maths and applied maths, but like the level that we were at there was crazy and competing with the guys I was in my course, really good friends from it as mm. well. But like when I'm handed a paper and I, I don't understand the first sentence and it's 10 pages long, but now I, if I have handed anything like that, I can look at it and be completely calm. And it's just like, just give this enough time and eventually you will break it down and you will understand it. Like I'm very comfortable now being uncomfortable. This, Which is important for me. Yeah, so like I could be throwing something and know that I don't have a clue how to deal with it, but be confident in my ability to break it down and to be able to figure it out with enough time. But it's just, you just have to keep, keep, keep going with it. And it's tough and it gets hard, but eventually just something clicks and you make that breakthrough and then it's all worth it for that. Like that's that's kind of what I've brought across from academics into sport that you just have to keep going because just, and eventually you just make small changes here and there. And yeah, the more trials of something you take, the more, the higher chances of it landing on the outcome you're looking for that's you know well, I suppose that's the basis uh, of it really isn't yeah, it yeah that's what you're looking for yeah. you know um, and, and then if you look at I suppose the last last week um, so uh, last weekend was the standard distance championship the week before was the middle distance championship um, did you think this time last year that you would hold three titles of that nature uh, at this time and no I didn't think that it wasn't something that I had um, planned really mm-hmm. so because I'm racing the longer distance stuff this year and it worked well that I could race at the national championships this year so I decided to give it a go and I, I probably got greedy mm. so the, the, the middle distance national champs and the Olympic distance champs were only a week apart and I think that rolled a lot of people off doing both straight away because very, I don't think it's very common to race half Ironman and then race an Olympic distance the following week but I think we we juggled it quite well here and with the coaching team we we did what needed to be done in the first race to be able to still produce a good result the second in the second race. And even yeah. last weekend was fairly stacked field. I mean you had Con Doherty, Owen Lyons, James Walton, Brian McChrystal who was fresh from Ironman in your top five. I mean there was a quality field of uh, of athletes in that, that that race last weekend. Yeah, um it was and it's everybody wants to win a national title so yeah. everybody who thought that they were in with a chance was there at the weekend and I put my name in the mix I felt like I had to I felt like I had it in me and it, it just everything went my way on the day yeah I was very happy with it I did I went hard from the start on the swim I felt like I might have needed a gap and um, before the run but my bike was quite a, I was quite happy with my bike as well and I also had a yeah, decent one as well. So everything just went well on the day. So I was... Um, you didn't yeah. beat McChrystal on the bike though? No, no. Um, even though he put two minutes into me and I'm actually delighted with that. Uh, I think anything, uh, anyone who can 
anyone who's beaten McChrystal is probably a professional cyclist to be honest he's um, he's an inner animal on the bike just an absolute different beast I mean watching him in y'all was seriously impressive like I think he I don't know did he put over 12 or 13 minutes into the next fastest cyclist like it's just class to watch that like just really class you, you were uh, on the start list for y'all but decided not to to go there yeah I, like I had all year I had no intentions of racing y'all I do eventually but it would have made no sense mm. for me to do it this year but after I had a few points in Germany after the race and I was thinking to myself you know they're all coming from all over the world to race in my own back garden like this is where triathlon had started for me I can't I can't not put up a fight you know mm-hmm. I have to I, ha- I have to do it I, ca- I couldn't just watch it like I was thinking it would kill me to just watch them racing and um, spoke to my coaches about it and they told me what I already knew like that it was a, a stupid decision like and it you know it it is it was a purely emotional decision it wasn't calculated um but yeah it and I knew it made sense not to do it but I just wanted to do it and it's hard because you know I need to juggle between what you want and what's what's, what's right. right yeah, yeah. In hindsight, it probably was the best decision. It was the best decision. And when I found out, when I saw on the day that the swim was cancelled, I, I was delighted that I wasn't racing because that would have put me 10 minutes down straight away. Yeah, um, you, you, would have had, you wouldn't have had an advantage. You'd no. have been chasing up beside Alistair Brownlee. Yeah. Um, but but McChrystal on the day had a phenomenal race. Unbelievable. It's class. And it's inspiring as well because it just raises the bar for Irish athletes racing the Ironman yeah. circuit. It makes you, t- you know... Um, it, it puts the di- it puts it within touching distance having yeah, somebody like but it also Brian means like you know well. like um, yeah it's just a breakthrough result in terms of Irish athletes podiuming at Emer Mullen as also it was was mm. great for that she had some unbelievable yeah. results and Brian hitting the po- he's regularly hit podiums at a middle distance racing and it just yeah it's nice to see other Irish athletes do it so it makes you think like you know if they can do it I could be able to do it I'm and the quality of the field on the day as well you know in terms of racing Alistair Brownlee you I mean know, that's what it took to beat yeah, him yeah so, that's what it took the only yeah. person who did it on the day yeah Olympic champion so yeah that's class yeah you were there on the day yourself watching it watching it um with 2020 on my mind maybe 2021 Okay. Um, the crowds were incredible. Unbelievable. Yeah. Have top. you ever seen anything like Windmill Hill and the people that were on it? Yeah, I've seen Windmill Hill on the other 364 <laughs> days of the year and it's nothing like it was. And no. I've never seen the weather yeah. like it was on race day. Honestly, I haven't seen anything like that. It's just but in fairness it didn't like it didn't stop people from turning up to support it. Mm. Uh, it was class. And I think anybody who's raced it who I've spoken to has just said to the atmosphere was unbelievable there, yeah. Yeah. But it's definitely a bucket list race for sure. And then, of course, you were planning to race in Dunleary at seventy point three Dunleary at the end of August. Um, are you hoping to take a an old scalp at a podium there as well? Well, I'll, the thing is with these races is the start lists are. You, there's not much information to be gotten just from the start list mm-hmm. because, as on the pro start list, you can enter. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be there on the day. Yeah. So there might be 20, 25 guys on the start list, 30, 40 even, but not everybody's going to turn up. And then on race day, what I've noticed is not, not everybody has a good day. There's always something happens. Like if you go on paper and you write out how you think the results will go, there's going to be somebody there has a puncture. Somebody just has a bad day. So Or somebody looks at the weather and just isn't up for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... All I'm trying to do is put myself in the best possible position to get the best result I can on the day. And whatever anybody else does is not my concern. All I'm worried about, if I get on a podium, brilliant. And that would be brilliant. That would be, like, that would be top class. Like, I've never podiumed at a a professional race before. But that's not my focus. My focus is just do everything I can to put myself in a position to get the best possible result on the day. And you've been out on the bike course a good few times at this stage. I'd say you're probably, it's like your back garden. For yeah, training. this was where I've been training all year. And um, it looks a lot nicer now than what it did in January and February. And I couldn't see in front of me. But uh, yeah, I've been around here all year. I know the roads. I know where the technical descents are. I know where I can carry speed through the corners. And I know where I need to be careful. And that is going to be a massive advantage on race day, no doubt. Uh, it always helps to know the course. And... Um, it's definitely an advantage 
And do you visual do you do you use visualization in advance of of the races when you're going into them, whether you know the course or not, like you'll know Dunleary, But do you do you take time out to kind of visualize yourself on the start line, what it'll feel like to get into the swim, you know, and, and work your way through? Yeah, the day? typically in the week before a race from swimming, I'm kind of thinking about the swim on race day. It's not something I've I do on purpose. It just happens naturally. And when I'm out on the bike, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about the race. Um, yeah, it's just something I do naturally, but it's not something I've. Um, it's not something I do with purpose. Mm. It's just always I love thinking about the race yeah. and planning potential situations in your head, or what would you do if this happened, or what would you do if this happened. Um, yeah, but with the. So what I find difficult initially with the switch was that. Um, you race reactively at the ITU stuff in terms. Of if somebody goes, you just go. You don't think you have to. You have to go with them. Whereas with the Ironman seventy point three racing, you need to be a lot more clued into your own body and tuned into pacing. And if somebody comes past you at speed, you don't react. You don't pick up the pace just because this guy is going at a quicker pace. Like this guy, like the person passing out, might be just just stronger than you on the bike. Might not be able to run, but might be just a great cyclist. Because if you do you'll pay for it. Mm. You're just going to pay for it eventually. Um, so like knowing, knowing my body, I think is something that I've, um, are getting to know it better is something I've improved on a lot this year. And I think, I think we can get lost in our watches and lost in heart rate and power and all these um, metrics. Whereas I think it's quite good here is if, if I'm doing an easy run, it's just an easy run and it's perceived effort is the determining factor. So no heart rate, no, no watch. Like nothing. an easy run is just easy. You okay. just run on whatever feels easy. And when you feel good, you might be running 20 seconds quicker than per kilometer as you do on a bad day. And you don't, you don't care about your speed. You don't care about, it's just time. If you do 40 minutes, you just run 40 minutes easy. And then in terms um, of the bike, I presume you're using wattage. Yeah. Yeah. Bike. I would use power on the bike. Um, um, so any of the intervals we do will be at numbers based on what I, on my test results here. So we've um, a lab here in in base to race that we use with the um, hop hop coaching team. So all my data is there, and like in and us down to the watt, what I'm able to um, to maintain, or what's a little bit above what I can do, and what's what I can maintain for a... So what did you hold in um, in the race against uh, Sebi on the bike in terms of wattage? I held, I averaged 300 watts and normalised power of 318 watts. But um, something we looked at after that race was that my power was, was quite was quite good, but my speed wasn't matching my power output. There would have been guys who might have rode three, four, five minutes quicker than me who might be a similar weight and producing the same power as me so you was kind of wondering what's going on there but I think some of that was I just wasn't um, I wasn't set up properly in terms of I wasn't flexible enough or I had my head held too high while I was racing I water bottles on the bike I probably should have had them somewhere where they were a bit more aerodynamic and so that's something I I've been working on with the group since and it's funny, kind of. I've gone full circle in terms of when you're time trialing. Initially, when someone starts out, all they're worried about is their average speed, mm. and then they might um, get a heart rate monitor and they'll start doing interval sessions based on heart rate, and then they'll go to the next level and start looking at power. power. And now I've gone right back again to at the end of the day, it's about how fast can you go back mm. to average speed. Doesn't matter what your power is if you're not going fast. Doesn't matter how high or how low your heart rate is if you're not going fast. Um, which is funny um, so it's all about going as fast as you can and in terms of a typical training week now I suppose you're you're probably on another recovery week this week because of the two big races at the weekend but on a normal uh, a normal week of training what are you covering? Uh, about 25 hours a week which isn't a huge amount of volume does that include your sleeping now as well or is oh, that not including your sleeping? no that's not including my sleep <laughs> yeah, I, and your eat Eating. Yeah, uh, about 25 hours a week, which isn't huge volume for somebody racing the distance I'm doing, but it's good quality work. Um, swimming four days a week with the group here, uh, out on the bike 
five, six days a week and running five days a week, maybe six. But I think one of the biggest changes this year is consistency. Mm. And there was maybe a 12 week block over winter where every Saturday was a four to six hour ride and every Sunday was a two hour run in the Wicklow Mountains. And there was 12 weeks in a row where that just happened every weekend as well as the training midweek. And off the back of that, I got to the stage where the two hour runs in the mountains were just fun. It was just easy. I was so fresh. What did, you, what did you run in, in Germany? A 113? A 114, 114 and a half, yeah. yeah. It must have been like a 10k. Yeah, and it felt, it just, it's just, just strength. Yeah. Just got to the stage where I felt really strong. I felt like I could run, I could run all day at an easy pace and it wasn't going to tire me. In terms of, I suppose, the favourite aspect of triathlon, is it swimming, cycling or running? Is, is You know, when you if you don't want to go out training, yeah and you have to do something what's the one you go to if i had to pick one i'd go running really yeah um swimming can be monotonous mm. you know you're going up and down the pool and you train at stupid o'clock in the morning as well like it's ridiculous and kids train so hard like there's kids all over the country training five six days a week at six in the morning like it's mental sport like and then they um, go to school or yeah. people go to work and then whereas you get to go back to bed well, i can go back to bed that luxury um, cycling is great but in the winter it's tough like it's yeah. just the weather is awful and, and would you do much of your training on the turbo then here on the bike in base to race when the weather's bad yeah yeah. yeah. or when it's a really uh, monitored session where the, where my focus is on h- hitting numbers then I'd do it in a kind of a monitored environment where it's easier to just solely focus on that and but if it's just a long, easy spin, I'd always want to do that on the road. And do you listen to music when you're training or do you watch Netflix or anything? Do you do, you uh, do any of that stuff or are you literally just I listen. To, I listen to on, podcasts. Do you? Yeah. Have you listened to this one before? Uh, I've listened to this one with Mike and I've... Uh, I, do you know what? I was listening to those Conspiracy Guys podcasts and I'd say my head was melting because <laughs> I'm in the Wicklow Mountains for four or five hours listening to Conspiracy Theories and I'm starting to... Uh, Get worried. Oh yeah, I'm starting to lose myself a are bit. Are you starting to see the bears out in the Wicklow Mountains? Yeah. yeah I, uh, see I the st- shadows? I had to stop that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But do you, do you enjoy the training? Do you I find it, it as yeah. a hardship? Or do you... It's, are you... it's hard, but when you... You just need that little nugget of something to to rem- to let you know that you're doing the right thing every now and again. And like for me, that was Heilbronn when I saw that you know I'm racing world champ, European mm-hmm. champion, and I'm like, I'm getting excited now thinking about it. Like it's like, I'm you're ready to go again. I'm, I yeah, nearly, you know, I'm here. Like I'm racing you. I you know, it won't be too long where you're going to be worried about me. You know that kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, in terms of um, I suppose people are going to want to know what you eat you know that people are obsessed yeah. with what people are eating and, and those percentage gains in terms yeah. of nutrition you know what are your go-to racing foods one specifically minute. because this is what people want to know well one of my favorite um quotes from um, a running coach with Lee Ville, Donny Walsh when he was when he was training hard and someone asked him about running uh and nutrition and he said when the fire's burning you can throw on what you want and just when you're training hard like you just you just eat you're just hungry no just good quality stuff you know like you don't need a nutritionist to tell you that going to a takeaway is a bad decision or if something's coming from a wrapper it's probably not the best you could be eating so just try to be as disciplined as possible eat good meals probably do eat a good volume of food and if i'm trying to cut a bit of weight i just cut down the volume of it and do you track your calories i have done when i've tried to lose weight um but Honestly, like, honestly, it's just cutting out the biscuits after eight o'clock in the evening. Like, once you have your dinner after that, anything else, it's just kind of comfort eating, really. Mm. So you should be in bed at eight o'clock. I know, yeah, yeah. So uh, anything after that, yeah. It's not... um, A lot of people get hung up on the nutrition side of things, but just eat good breakfast, good lunch, good dinner, and, yeah, have your snacks. But it's um, it's not rocket science. Just good food. And and you know you know if you're getting the takeaway that you're not you're not behaving yourself like I suppose you know. for most people like this is a hobby this is a passion uh, and yeah. a lifestyle choice as opposed to being a professional so you know are you really pedantic about your food though like especially coming up to race race week would you be really strict on yourself or no no I wouldn't just be. no stick to I what you've be. been doing I, I can probably should be a bit more um, disciplined disciplined but. I'm happy that at the same time you need to be flexible though because if you're going to these countries you don't know what you're going to be able to eat the night before 
you know, if you always have the same thing and next thing you're landed in some country and you can't find that dish, like, so, well, that's what I'm going to tell myself anyway. So I'm going to try and convince that I'm at an advantage that I'm able to eat whatever I want. So that doesn't matter where I'll go, I'll be ready. Some lads might be under pressure to find their uh, eating their stag ball or something, but not me. I'll be grand. I'll give me, You'll be up give Japan, me anything. I'll Japan have Japan eating yeah. sushi. <laughs> yeah. um, you mentioned Doni there uh, from Lee Vale. Um, yeah. One of the biggest influences Definitely. in your life, I imagine. Definitely. In terms of my attitude towards sport, racing, life in general, Doni Walsh and Timmy Barry, as well as coaching me on the bike when I was in Cork, those guys were really good to me growing up. Um, really good for advice outside the sport when I needed it because when you're at that age when you're 16, 17, 18 when you, when you hit 18 I think is a critical stage for any athlete and when I see really really good young athletes I in the back of my mind I'm always thinking yeah let's see how they react to college or let's see how they react to that transition phase once you, you know once drink is involved and once you hit college and you've got a bit of freedom how do you then you really need to you need to decide what you want and that's like a, a an important kind of change I think and I think those guys Donnie and Timmy understood me really well and knew what what kind of person I am and um, they were just really good for advice and for handling like it got to a stage in second year in university where I had considered dropping out because I wanted to go full time at triathlon and I thought I'm racing guys here that are professionals and when I come back from a race people would say Asher didn't you do very good sure you were racing professionals and in my mind that's not good enough I don't want to have an excuse like it's not good enough for me to lose to somebody because I have an excuse like that should be that excuse should be the number one thing you get rid of and in my mind at the time was like right university needs to go it's what's stopping me from being competitive with these professional athletes and I got a phone call from Timmy and he wasn't long telling me where to go Um, and my parents obviously were telling me too, but like, you know, you're not going to listen. Yeah. It's when he told me what he was like, are you, are you mad? Like, and he was dead right because now I'm in a situation where I have my degree. And I know that it, worst case scenario, if I, if I was injured in the morning, I could never race again. I'm in a, a position where I'd be okay in terms of finding a job or things like that. But, um, I think you need people like that to help you, or to give you that bit of advice when you're not sure what to do mm-hmm. or when you're when you lose the run of yourself a bit and Donny was brilliant for that as well just with um, when I was in college and stuff yeah and the experience that those guys would have had in dealing with athletes similar yeah, situations because they'd have gone through Absolutely. those stages themselves and would have yeah. seen it with other athletes that they were yeah. coaching and stuff yeah um, yeah you make a very valid point there about the turning point to kind of 18, uni- 18 years of age and, and going into university. But you see an awful lot of kids come out of swimming before their state exams. So kind of third year in secondary school, you see a lot of people dropping yeah. out. In, in terms of trying to keep people in sport, to keep kids in the yeah. swimming side of things or the triathlon, because we do have quite an awful lot of kids now that are coming through the junior ranks. Yeah. Um, because of the great programs that are being run by Trots on Ireland and all the, the clubs around the country but if you had your time back over again what would you say to people to try and keep the kids in sport and swimming and keep them racing and training at a junior level it's really tough like mm. it is tough um, I think the junior cert and the leaving cert is used as an excuse to pack up swimming I genuinely like what are you going to do like get up at 6 in the morning and study do you know what no, I mean? No, but I think there's a lot of stress put on on kids. They're racing at a high level in swimming or they're training and then yeah. they've got their exams and they're, 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 there's the natural level of tiredness as well that comes I think with you, it. you have to want it. Your, you parents, want it. your parents can't want it for you. Yeah, you have to want it yourself. It. Yeah. Like if you're not, like, yeah, you need to want it yourself. And if you really want to, to swim and to swim at a high level, you're going to want to train. And... I don't think you the junior cert or the leaving cert is um, an excuse for that. Like I trained through the leaving cert. I raced triathlon the week on a Sunday and sat physics paper one or on the on the Monday, and I did well in both. Didn't have an issue with it. No time management is a thing, and I suppose for kids they're probably worried about missing out on. Um, their friends Things who aren't friends, in triathlon yeah, or who yeah. are playing GA or rugby yeah. or football and, and that is tough like I mean it's tough yeah mm. but 
that's that, yeah it's tough it's yeah. your it's your decision but you have to want you it. know if, if you want it enough you'll be willing to do it like there's no it's it's not it's just hard work it is hard it work is. and you've worked hard yeah and and i think that when you work hard and you see the results see the problem is like you can get satisfaction very quickly from something small and it's immediate but it's very shallow and it's gone again the next day possibly all these micro little um the little gains, yeah, the little wins. But like, it's very hard and not everybody can do this. And I'm lucky that I can. Is in the back of my mind, I'm thinking there's something coming for me eventually. It might not come today or tomorrow, but it's coming eventually. Something good. And I'm willing to work hard and not have the instant kind of gratifications, but waiting out on something bigger and more meaningful. And that comes with a lot of hard work. And that's kind of my mindset and how I think of it in terms of, yeah, like I mightn't have gone to Thailand with my friends in college or went on a J1 or done any of that stuff. And sometimes, like, I mean, I'm only human as well. I think, do I regret doing that? Sometimes I think, yeah, like, like why? All I did was ride my bike and run around and swim up and down a pool. Do you know what I mean? Like, I missed out on all these experiences. But now when I talk to them, they're like, I'd love to be doing what you're doing. I'd love to be traveling abroad, doing a sport I love, racing, being competitive amongst the best people in the world. Like, I'd love to be doing that. And when I hear that, then it makes me think, yeah, I'm doing the right thing, you know. Do you count yourself as lucky? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm lucky. I'm lucky to have such good parents that have always been supportive. Um, I'm lucky that my mum sat me down when I was in primary school and made me learn my spellings and learn my times tables and just set me up and put me into secondary school in the best position possible to get the best out of myself. Gave me every opportunity to be the best I could be and I feel that I owe them and everybody that their hard work they put in that I want to match that and give them everything I have as well to be the best that I can be as a result um, I'm very lucky to be surrounded by such good people in Cork that have been coaching me Donny, Timmy they've been brilliant I'm really lucky right now to be to have Ian and Gavin hop up to have Base to Race supporting me uh, yeah I work hard but I'm really lucky I mean if I was born into another family or you know it's like I'm really lucky yeah but I'm, I also work hard but there's no denying that I'm really lucky as well and, yeah. and there seems to be a real sense of gratitude coming from you there Stephen looking at you as you're telling me that you're lucky there's a real sense of um, gratitude yeah like and thankfulness that you've been fortunate enough to do this well it's true because like um, it was only recently I was kind of when I had bad results last year, I was on the, on the edge of thinking, no, it's not for me, I'm not good enough. And I was kind of had a dilemma of, do I look for a job or do I focus on triathlon? And someone said it to me, like, you don't know how lucky you are to have that dilemma. Like, you think of people who are struggling, do you know, to put f- food on the table, like, and here I am worrying about, should I get a job or focus on triathlon? Like, I'm extremely lucky to have that, do you know? And then, um, so, yeah, yeah, that's that's how I feel about it anyway. Yeah, yeah it's very humbling watching your, your reaction here in, in the interview to, to that question. Um, I think you have worked extremely hard and I think it shows in your results and, you know, it shows in the passion that you have for the sport as well, which comes clear yeah. to everything that you talk about today has been about the passion and the dedication yeah. to your sport and well, to your craft, really. Well, I love it. Like, you know, I do. And I want to be... Like my my biggest fear would be sitting at a bar stool in thirty forty years time, um, thinking what if you know what I mean? Like what if I had done this? What if I had done that? And I'm really lucky as well that Jess, my girlfriend, supports what I do as well. Like it's quite tough. Like we don't mm-hmm. see much of each other, and hopefully now we'll see more of each other over the next few weeks. But she's been brilliant, like supporting me and what I've been doing, and she's not afraid to tell me where to go as well when I need to. Do you know what I mean? She probably needs to be able to tell yeah. you where to go. Like if I like you win national champs like two weekends in a row, and people are singing your praises. And next thing, you get a phone call saying, sure, how are you going to be competitive internationally if you can't win at home? Do you know what I mean? It brings you back to earth fairly quickly. It does. Or yeah. as, uh, as, as Mike Riley said to me, he said, I still have to bring out the trash cans yeah. at home. You know, um, yeah. I suppose the, 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 the one thing I wanted to ask you as well is, uh, if there was one race in the world that you could do and win, what would it be? Across every, every aspect of triathlon. Like, I suppose the right answer would be Kona because it's the World Championships. But honestly, mm. I'd rather win y'all. 
you'd rather win the Ironman, the Ironman Ireland in y'all I think it would mean more to me yeah it's the emotional local it's connection. just everything like yeah it just has it all like it's where I grew up it's where I started doing triathlon and I think it would yeah that would that would mean more to me than um, than any, I think that would be the biggest race for me yeah yeah so we need to watch this space for 2020 2021 yeah I, I need to be patient and smart and listen to those around me who know better than I do because um, sometimes I make decisions emotionally based decisions that aren't the most calculated like I was saying earlier with y'all so I need to be careful and yeah event hopefully 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 everything goes well like I just need to like stay I stay consistent I can't think you see it's quite like if I if I didn't have that result in Germany or if, if I wasn't starting to see those nuggets like I mightn't still be doing the sport like because mm-hmm. I need I need like it's not like I'm making money doing this like, but it's a validation that yeah, the hard work you are it's putting like, in I just, I'm trying to survive like month to month and I'm thinking like just, just get to next month like just get to next month and like maybe you'll get a race you might get prize money at a race next month and then I'm like and then next month we'll worry about the month after that then and you who know. knows, you might even get a sponsor out of the podcast. Yeah, Fingers yeah. crossed, you might have right. somebody listening who has some money that they can use to, to sponsor your 2020 season, which would be yeah. fantastic. All inquiries can come to me directly and I'll only take a small agency fee. <laughs> um, I just want to, we're going to finish up very shortly now, but I just want to ask, um, you know, I suppose there's a lot of age group athletes now out there that are taking up the sport kind of the age, a little bit older than, than, than what you would have started at. And, you know, have you any words of wisdom for the athletes who are kind of mid-pack uh, or even starting out and just want to have fun with it, but also want to race well? You know, have you any advice for, for athletes that are in the sport of triathlon, I suppose, not take themselves too seriously is one aspect of it. Yeah, I suppose, like, they're doing it for enjoyment. Mm. So you have to make sure you're enjoying it, you know. And there's no point in putting yourself under too much pressure um, for racing or things like that if it's something you're doing just for enjoyment just do what you need to do to enjoy it um, try and get with a group try and swim with a group try and go out on the bike with a group try and run with a group it's just so much more fun mm. um, if you want to take it more seriously yeah you can start um, looking at coaches and things to improve on but I mean some people get their kicks from improving as well you know it depends what you're what you're looking to get out of the sport if it's just enjoyment look at a few races around Ireland if you want to stay local pick a few races there's some really nice races here um if you want to pick that one big event abroad in a year do that but i think it's to be honest it's quite hard to generalize because everybody's just got such different um want to get different like mm-hmm. some people just want like my dad's doing his first ever triathlon this year he only learned to swim a few years ago wow. uh, he's doing um y- y'all the sprint in y'all oh very good yeah and like it's just it's Does mad. it give you great pride yeah, to see class. that your dad is now doing triathlon? It's class, yeah. Because like he only started swimming a few years ago, did the least swim, and um, was only out on the road on the bike for the first time a few weeks ago. It's class. It's just class seeing that. It's very inspiring. I'd yeah, say. it's cool. Like it's really cool. And and I have friends now that might have um, see I, like twenty five last week, and I'm just at the age now where friends who would have been partying hard through college work in a year or two or three now are getting to the stage where they're like do you know I need to start looking after myself a bit and they're at that stage now where they're like I've had enough I can't just keep doing this every Saturday Friday and Saturday night for the rest of my life I want something different and a lot of them are getting into sport now and it's great it's class seeing guys um, um, trying something different and doing stuff and it's just really cool seeing. it's funny like because you might have guys who have no interest in what I've been doing um for the last 10 years and then all of a sudden they want to know what training I've been doing they want <laughs> to know what bike to buy yeah, what, what yeah. wetsuit to get and yeah. where they can go training yeah or like um, there was a guy who came to Leeville a few years ago and he asked Tony um, I'm doing um, a marathon in 5 or 6 months any training you'd recommend to run my fastest time possible and he said oh yeah yeah about 10 years training uh, <laughs> typical Tony so, yeah but um, yeah it's class I love seeing people getting into the sport like especially for people who've like you know, they might have never done sport before and they're thinking of doing their first triathlon. Just do it. It's class. Like, it's really cool. It's and such a buzz. Like, it really is. And if I was to yeah. ask you one final question and it's going to be who inspires you in sport? Who inspires me in sport? Probably Donny. Yeah, Donny Walsh. Yeah, I mean, he raced in the, the Olympics in 1972 in the, in the marathon. Uh, just, just, and it's, 
it's not just his achievements in sport it's his ability to um, to get a group together to train together in Cork and just the, the just the crack like that we have when we're when we're training together in Cork and um, good fun on the warm-up you, you work hard you do your session and you cool down and just kind of the way he would have and the way he does just look after his athletes and stuff I yeah probably the most inspiring for me I don't have my role models are local people and um, because I can relate to them and I know them and the coaches locally the people that I've seen uh, I don't really I'm not really inspired by um, or get motivation from generic posts on social media from athletes that I know nothing about because I don't know how believable any of that stuff is as well whereas if I can relate to somebody and if I know them and if I can have a conversation with them and I can see what they've actually done and how they've gotten to where they are that's a lot more inspiring for me than just um, just a Photoshop picture on the internet you know well, I think we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much to Chris for joining us here on uh, episode five of Try Talking Sport. Thanks everyone for listening to the show. If you enjoyed it, please take 30 seconds to give us a review on Apple Podcasts. For more information and to check out our previous episodes, log on to www.trytalkingsport.com. Huge thank you, of course, to the wonderful people at Base to Race here in Ballymont in Dublin who have facilitated hosting this afternoon's interview. You can check out their store online or here uh, in person in Ballymount. See you next time. Thanks a million.